Hello and welcome to today's lecture on IEEE 802 LANs. In the last lecture, we have discussed about the various applications of medium access control techniques. One of the important applications of medium access control techniques is in local area networks. In this lecture, I shall introduce to you the first set of standards which were developed by the IEEE 802 committee. Here is the outline of today's lecture. First, I shall consider the basic characteristics of LAN, uh, particularly the topology, transmission media, and medium access control. These are the three parameters which characterizes a local area network. Then I shall uh, discuss about the three standards which were developed by IEEE 802 committee which are known as IEEE 802.3 that is based on CSMS CD and the most popular version of it is known as Ethernet. Another is based on uh, token, ba token bus which is known as IEEE 802.4 and the third one which we shall discuss today is IEEE 802.5 which is token ring based. So, we shall discuss about these three uh, different types of local area networks and, com and compare the performance of these three types of LANs at the end. On completion, the students will be able to explain the basic characteristics of local area networks. They will be able to explain the operation of IEEE 802 local area networks. Uh, the first one is IEEE 802.3 based on CSMS CD. Then the second one is IEEE 802.4 based on token bus. The third one is IEEE 802.5 based on token ring. And they will be able to compare the performance of these, th of these three LANs. Uh, First of all, let us define what do we mean by local area networks. Earlier, we have discussed about the packet switch networks, where we have seen the network can span over a very large geographical area, which are known as wide area networks. On the contrary, local area networks cover a very small geographical area it can be a room, a campus, a building. So, it does not uh, cover a very large area, say so, maybe five, 5 kilometer wide on in both directions or 3 kilometer wide in both directions. So, a small geographic area is one of the key features of local area networks. Second important feature is high reliability. In wide area network we have seen in packet switch networks, we because the medium use is not very reliable, the standard telephone network using twisted pair, the uh, reliability is very poor. On the other hand, in local area networks we shall see it uses very, uh, very uh, reliable media like optical fiber, coaxial cable. And of course, uh, it uses uh, tw twisted pair, but uh, very small uh, very small segment length. As a result, it is very reliable. So, the need for error detection and correction is minimal here, particularly error, error correction is not used. However, error detection is provided as part of the schemes as you shall see. Then it allows high data rate. We have seen that the packet, sw packet switch networks, the wide error networks, uh, do not have very high speed, although over the years the speed has increased. But as we shall see, the local area network will have very high speed starting with maybe 10 megabits per second uh, to nowadays 10 gigabits per second. So, you see the, the, wide, the local area networks uh, offer very high speed. Another important characteristic is that local area networks are privately owned wide area networks are usually owned by state, that means the government. Of course, nowadays uh, many private companies are also uh, owner of uh, wide area networks, but that is the normal situation. 
On the contrary, local area networks owned by uh, are privately owned. That means it can be owned by a single person or an organization or academic or government or industry, whatever it may be. So, these are the typical uh, characteristics of uh, local area networks or typical features of local area networks. Question arises, how do you characterize a LAN? There are three important parameters, the topology, transmission media and medium access control techniques. So, these three parameters characterize a LAN and we shall see what are the various alternatives available so far as topology is concerned, transmission media is concerned and medium access control technique is concerned. First, let us start with the topology. The topology of a network defines how nodes and stations are connected. That means, uh, as we know in a local area network, network you have to connect a number of uh, computers or stations need not be computer, it can be peripherals and other communication equipments like uh, PDL, cell phones and what not. So, uh, uh, you can see there are three important topologies which are shown here. First one is bus in which there is a shared media, shared media and that shared media is shared by all the nodes. That means, all the uh, computers or stations are directly connected to the bus. It is similar to that electrical uh, line distribution. All the, uh, all the electrical equipment are connected to the electrical bus. So, it is somewhat like that and we shall see how different computers can be connected to a common bus. So, here all nodes are connected to a common medium. So, we can say you require a single segment of the medium in this particular case. Another alternative is star, which is also used, commonly used. Uh, here all nodes are connected to a central node. As you can see, here you have got a central node to which all the computers are connected. That central node can be a hub, later on we shall discuss about it in more detail or it can be a switch to which uh, a different computers or other equipment, equipments can be connected. So, you have got a central node through which all the communication take place. So, uh, as you can see, it appears like a star. So, that is why it is called star topology. The third alternative is in the form of a ring, where nodes form a ring by point to point links to the adjacent neighbors. Here, as you can see, each computer or station is connected to its neighbor with the help of point to point links and point to point links are uh, ultimately forms a ring. Uh, so, all the computers are connected in the form of a ring and we shall see uh, how they communicate with each other later on. Now, uh, as we shall see the transmission media, uh, uh, there are varieties of transmission media that can be used. The most popular is the twisted pair although it has got the minimum bandwidth, but it serves the purpose in many situations. The second alternative is coaxial cable, which is widely used and the, uh, then the third option is optical fiber. The optical fiber is gradually becoming more and more popular because of its very high bandwidth as you know. So, optical fiber is widely used nowadays in local area networks and the last alternative is the wireless, wireless communication and we shall see how different alternatives are possible for wireless transmission. Now, there is a close relationship between the topology and transmission media. The transmission media that you choose sometimes dictates what type of topology that can be used or you can say the other way if for a particular topology a some special some special types of transmission media are suitable. For example, for bus coaxial cable is the media which is the most suitable and coaxial cable is used for whenever bus topology is used. On the other hand for ring, the it is possible to use twisted pair optical fiber, but also it is possible to use coaxial cable if coaxial cable if necessary. On the other hand for star topology, the uh, it is possible to use twisted pair and optical fiber. These are the most commonly used 
uh, medium. So we find that there is some relationship between the topology and transmission media and for different lands uh, these combinations are used. Finally, it comes to we come to the third important parameter that is the medium access control technique that is being used. We have already discussed different types of medium access control techniques. The for the uh, uh, I mean the most popular medium access control that is being used is CSMS CA, token passing, CSMS CD, token passing, CSMS CA and of course there are other uh, uh, and other medium access control techniques like FDMA, TDMA, CDMA which are also used, but uh, for the three different types of LAN that we shall discuss today, we shall find that these are the two techniques which are used. That means, these two techniques will be used. So, these are the various alternatives of medium access control techniques which are used uh, in different types of uh, local area networks. Uh, now, let us focus on the IEEE 802 standard lands. Now, 80, IEEE 802 committee developed as you can see three different standards. The uh, as I mentioned IEEE 802.3, IEEE 802.4, IEEE 802.5. Now, all these three standards share two common sub layers. First one is IEEE 802.1. This IEEE 802.1 essentially introduces different types of LANs and also it serves uh, the some kind of uh, inter networking uh, purpose. So, it is essentially used for inter networking uh, and also as an interface to the upper layers. Then you have got uh, logical link control which is essentially part of the data link layer of the OSI model. Similarly, the, uh, the data link layer has got has been divided into su two sub layers. One is your logical link control LLC and another is medium access control MAC. So, this data link layer has been divided into two sub layers in IEEE 802. So, uh, uh, the functions of and the, then the lower part is the physical layer and here are the uh, different functions performed by the two different layers, the data link layer and the physical layer. The physical layer performs the encoding and decoding. As you know, whenever you send digital signal, you have to perform uh, some kind of encoding. Uh, Manchester encoding and different types of encodings are used. So, that encoding and decoding is done, then collision detection carrier sensing, if you use CSMS CD or CSMS CA, you have to perform collision detection and carrier sensing. Then of course, you have to do transmission and receipt, transmission of packets and this receipt of packets. See, these are the functions of the physical layer, which directly interfaces with the medium. Then the data link layer, which is above the physical layer, performs station interface. It performs the data encapsulation and decapsulations, as we shall see it will form a some kind of frame, so that it is possible to perform synchronization uh, and other functions as you shall see. Then it does link management and collision management. So, whenever uh, collision takes place, it, it does the management, so that it comes out of the collision and also it performs this uh, link management as we shall discuss in detail later on. So, these are the uh, these are the three different types of standards. We shall consider them one after the other. First, we shall focus on the IEEE 802.3 specification, which is based on CSMS CD, as I mentioned. Let us first focus on the physical layer. So, in the physical layer, it supports different type of transmission media. So, the types of transmission media that it supports varies from twisted pair to optical fiber. So, as you can see, uh, it is concisely represented in the form of 10 base 5 or 10 base 2 or 10 base T or 10 base F. This 10 specifies the data rate, that means data rate is 10 megabits per second. So, this 10 signifies the data rate 
and this base specifies whether it is base band or broad band. So, in this particular case 10 base means base band, however, there is a possibility of using broad band in such a case it will be 10 broad 36 coaxial. So, in this case it is a broad band communication. On the other hand for all these options which are shown here it is uh, uh, say 10 base 5, what is the significance of this number 5? Here 5 signifies that each segment of the cable can be 500 meters in length. So, that is it signifies the maximum segment length. This for example, for the second option the first option is 10 base 5 which uses thick wire coaxial cable, we shall discuss about it in more detail. Then 10 base 2 which uses thin wire coaxial cable which is also known as cheaper net that can use a segment length. Um, of maximum length say maximum segment length of 185 meter which is uh, rounded up to 2. Then the third uh, medium that is being used is twisted pair and the maximum segment length is 100 meter. And the fourth one is fiber optical fiber that is your uh, multimode fiber is being used here maximum length is 2000 meter or 2 kilometer. And on each segment you can have uh, different number of segments for example, number of nodes or computers you can say for example, in 10 base 5 you can have 100 uh, computers, in 10 base 2 you can have 30 computers on a single segment, on 10 base T you can have 1024 computers, on 10 base 5 or you can have uh, 10024 computers. And whenever uh, you are using broadband of course, the number as you can see is 36 and uh, uh, 36 is the length uh, of 36 meter and number is uh, I think 1224. Now, the signaling used uh, in different situations are here for, bro for base band, the signaling that is used is Manchester. We know that uh, Manchester encoding helps you to synchronize the uh, clock at the receiving end, that is why Manchester encoding is used in IEEE 802 or Ethernet which is a uh, which is similar to IEEE 802.3. On the other hand whenever broadband signaling is used differential phase shift keying is used and uh, of course, the use of this is not very uh, popular I mean it is not very popular uh, baseband signaling is most popular that is why we shall mainly focus on the uh, baseband uh, signaling. I mean the networks based on baseband signaling. Let us consider the three cases, uh, rather the four cases that is being used in IEEE 802.3. First one is I 10 base 5, it supports as I mentioned 10 stands for 10 megabits per second baseband transmission, base stands for baseband. The standard specifies 0 0.5 inch coaxial cable known as yellow cable or thick ethernet. So, it it is uh, it looks like the cable that is being used as host pipe for in gardening yellow pipe. And each cable segment can be maximum 500 meters long as I mentioned this 5 signifies that and up to maximum of 5 cable segments can be connected using repeaters with maximum length of 2005 meters. That means, you can have two I mean a, a number of segments connected with the help of repeaters. So, you can put a repeater and then connect to such segments. In this way, you can have four such repeaters in between and connect five such segment in cascade to have a maximum length of 2500 meters. And as I mentioned at most 1024 uh, stations per ethernet network is allowed, however, on each segment the number is only 100. So, on each segment you can have 100 nodes or users. Now, let us see how exactly this uh, 10 base 5 works, how the cabling is done. This is that coaxial cable, that yellow coaxial cable of 0.5 inch diameter is running and to connect one computer a trans receiver is directly attached, firmly attached to the cable and a vampire, vampire hole vampire uh, um, hole is made, uh, vampire it is called tap, vampire tap is being made which goes 
to the almost half the coaxial cable. So, that means it touches the inner portion of the uh, uh, that means the core conductor and um, uh, up that means uh, the core conductor is connected and the upper conductor is, is in the form of braided mesh. So, these two are connected to a transceiver which is directly connected firmly attached to the cable and from that uh, transceiver, uh, transmiss, uh, transceiver one uh, AUI cable attachment unit interface cable is connected comes to the computer. Uh, in the computer you have got a uh, network interface card or NIC. So, to each computer it is either built in as part of the motherboard or there is a separate card. So, from the AUI, AUI cable can be 50 meters in length. Uh, so, this is how a, uh, a computer can be connected uh, in the case of a 10 base 5 uh, standard. So, uh, this is the 500 meter segment and at each both ends we have got terminator. This terminator is very important so that there is no signal reflection at the other end. So, uh, uh, this is one segment and whenever a computer has to be connected a vampire tap is made and a transceiver is attached and that uh, from that transceiver a UI cable goes to a computer. This is how to this uh, coaxial cable different computers can be connected. In this diagram two computers are connected with the help of two transceivers. So, it can it the transceiver does send receive collision detection electronic isolation and the other function is done by the network interface card which is part of the motherboard of the which is uh, connected to the motherboard of the uh, computer. So, this is how the 10 base 5 works. On the other hand the 10 base 2 also supports 10 megabits per second baseband transmission. The standard specifies 0 0.25 inch coaxial cable known as cheaper net or thin ethernet. So, here the coaxial cable is of cheaper variety which is used in cable TV and which is 0 0.25 inch diameter and that is why it is also called cheaper net because of its lower cost and also it is called thin ethernet because this diameter is thinner than the uh, standard uh, 10 base 5. So, here as you have as I mentioned this two actually uh, 185 meter is the maximum segment length and up to 5 cable segments can be connected using repeaters with a maximum length of 925 meters. So, in this way you can have uh, um, with 5 repeaters you can have 925 meters and total number of computers is same 1024. Now, uh, this particular uh, the it is connected it is connected in this manner the cable is uh, whenever a computer has to be uh, connected the coaxial cable is cut and there is a BNC T type connector uh, uh, at both the the cable is attached at both ends of the cable cut cable a BNC T BNC connector is con connected and that can be connected to the net network interface card. Uh, which is available in the form of a T. So, this T connector is essentially connected to the network interface card and then these two which are connected to two ends of the cable can be connected to the network interface card. So, in this way this uh, thin ethernet cable can snake through the entire uh, building or entire floor and can go from one computer to another computer having a BNC T connector for each of the computer. Then comes the 10 base T which supports again supports 10 megabits baseband signal and uh, baseband signaling. Here it uses twisted pair as I mentioned uh, the twisted pair can be used both of category 3 or category 5 cables and it requires a hub or uh, the hub in the as the center node hub is essentially multi port repeater. hub is a multi port repeater. That means, whatever signal is present here are also present in all the ports and uh, the stations are connected with the help of a RG45 connector. That means, this twisted pair cable is connected to the hub with the help of a RG45 connector 
and maximum length of each of these segments can be at most 100 meters as you can see. And this approach, this uh, you may be asking why we have deviated from using coaxial cable. Actually, by you, in, in case of 10 base 5 or 10 base 2, there is always a problem of loose connection, cut and other problems. And for that purpose, time domain refractometry is used for detection of fault and which is very time consuming. So, that problem can be avoided in case of uh, this hub based 10 base T uh, Ethernet uh, network, when it is very easy to maintain and diagnose a fault. So, that is why this particular topology has become very popular. Now, another alternative as I mentioned is 10 base F, where F stands for fiber. We can use 10 base fiber, uh, particularly when the distance uh, is and the distance is longer. So, uh, there are three alternatives 10 base FP. A passive star uh, topology is used, which allows you 1 kilometer link, and 10 base FL, which is FL, which is the most popular and asynchronous point to point link, allowing it gives you up to 2 kilometer. And third alternative is 10 base FB, a synchronous point to point link, which also used to up to 2 kilometer in 50, 15 cascaded repeaters can be used in this particular case. So, we have seen the various uh, alternatives of uh, the Ethernet or IEEE 802.2. So, as I mentioned, Ethernet and IEEE 802.2 are not really the same. Ethernet was the standard developed by Xerox, DEC and Intel and IEEE 802.2 was developed based on Ethernet. So, that sometimes we uh, whenever IEEE 802.2 is mentioned, we refer it to Ethernet, but they are not exactly same. Ethernet was the standard developed by, by the three companies, uh, DEC, uh, Xerox and Intel. On the other hand, IEEE 802.3 was developed by IEEE 802.2 committee. However, they are very similar. As you can see, there is some dissimil dissimilarity in the frame format. Uh, there is a preamble preamble is a sequence of one zeros, alternative one zeros and since it uses Manchester encode encoding, the consecutive one zeros appear as uh, 10 megabit, uh, 10 megabit per second, uh, um, uh, per second uh, square waves at the receiving end with the help which the receiver can do the synchronization. Then in, then in IEEE 802.3, there is a start frame delimiter, which is of 1 byte, that means 10101011, which, which signifies the start of a frame. So, synchronization is done with the help of these 7 bytes, that means 7 bytes means 7 into 8, 56 alternate bits, 1010 bits. Then it uses the destination address. Uh, starting at uh, the source address, destination medium access control address, source medium access control address and this destination address and source address are essentially 48 bit. As you can see, the total length is 48 bit. This is the MAC address and the first two bits defines the individual at whether uh, this is meant for individual address. If it is one, it is meant for uh, group address and whenever this is this uh, u um, slash l bit g 0, then it is meant for global administrative administered address or 1 stands for local administered address. So, with the help of these two bits, the uh, it defines the nature whether it is meant for unicast, broadcast or multicast. And with the help of the 46 bits, it allows you about a uh, uh, large number of uh, 7 into 10 to the power 13 global addresses. So, it allows you to have so many addresses to be used in case of Ethernet and this is a fixed address which is being used uh, in this case. Of course, the IEEE 802.3 standard originally allowed uh, both 2 byte address and 6 byte address, but 6 byte address is the most popular. Then LEN stands for the length of the uh, length or the number of data bytes. As you can see here, it differs from Ethernet. In case of Ethernet, it defines the type, type of the higher level protocol. On the other hand, in IEEE 802.3, it specifies the 
specify, it specifies the number of data bytes. So, here is the number of data bytes. The data bytes can vary from 46 to uh, 1500. You may be asking why 46? The reason for that is uh, there is a restriction on minimum length of the frame and that has to be if the data byte is 0, then a 46 byte pad is introduced. That is why whenever there is a uh, 46, the, the data byte is 0, there is a 46 byte uh, uh, byte pad. On the other hand, if uh, the data byte is itself more than 46 byte, it can be only the data byte, no pad is necessary. And finally, there is a frame check sequence which uses the uh, that CRC uh, 4 byte that means 32 bit uh, slightly redundancy code for error detection. So, as you can see in LAN in IEEE 802 error detection was allowed was provided. I have already discussed about this. Then there is another important point uh, as you can see between two frames some there is a mandatory gap of 9.6 microsecond. This gap is allowed which is essentially 96 bit time de uh, delays provided between frame transmissions. This is used, this is provided to enable other stations wishing to transmit to take over at this time. For example, one frame transmission is over and before another frame can be transmitted, uh, this gap is allowed so that uh, other stations can send their frame. Of course, uh, there is a possibility of collision. We have already discussed about how the uh, how this uh, binary exponential backup algorithm is used whenever there is collisions or multiple collisions and I need not discuss it here at this point. So, using this, uh, um, this binary exponential backup algorithm, it comes out of the collision if possible. Otherwise, after 16 attempts, 1 plus 15 collision attempts, it comes out and the uh, packet is discarded. Now, uh, there are some important points to be discussed about the collision detection. Uh, as you know, a station sends a frame and send, after, uh, while sending it senses the medium and collision is detected if station sense, senses exceeded the signal strength. That means, essentially it is done some by some kind of analog signaling by analog circuit. If the signal level is higher, then it detects a collision, particularly in coaxial cable. On the other hand, whenever the twisted pair is used, then of course, uh, as you know, you are using a some kind of hub. So, if there is signal on more than one port, that means there is collision. So, this is how collision is detected and whenever a collision occurs, uh, what the station does? The station, uh, as you know, the transmitting station sends a jamming signal after collision is detected and it can be either 32 bit jamming signal, alternate 1s and 0s or 48 bit jamming signal. So, the jamming signal serves as a mechanism to cause non-transmitting stations to wait until the jam signal ends. That means, the transmitting stations who have suffered collision will send the jamming signal and the, the, so that jamming signal will alert the other stations so that they will wait until the jamming signal is over before starting transmission. Now, as I mentioned, there is a uh, concept of minimum frame size, how it occurs. The reason for that comes from this, uh, this uh, particular situation as you can see uh, that A starts transmission at time t is equal to 0 and before it reaches the other end, the, the other end the B starts transmission and uh, of course, when this, frame, this, uh, this, end, this end reaches, there is a collision here, collision is detected by B when this also reaches A, there is a collision. So, you can see uh, depending on the uh, propagation time, where tau is the propagation time, the, a frame must take more than uh, 2 tau, that is the uh, 2 times the propagation time to, uh, to, uh, for, for detection of collision. Now, in terms of slot time, this corresponds to 51.2 sec microsecond, which is corresponding to uh, 512 bytes. That means, it is as it assumes that uh, whenever you have got uh, say uh, uh, a, a maximum number of segments 
connected by repeaters. So, this is a repeater here, another segment. In this way, you can have a number of segments cascaded and then the end to end delay is uh, 2 times the end of delays for 51.2 microsecond is assumed. So, this corresponds to 512 bytes. So, you require the frame size a minimum of 62 bytes. Of course, uh, the other parts are there. For example, you have got the other parts. So, 6 plus 6 plus 2 plus 4. So, if you add these two, uh, 12, 14, uh, then 20. So, this if you subtract 20 from 64, uh, sorry, uh, 6 plus 6, 12, 14, 18. 18 if you sub subtract from 64, you get 46. That is how the 46 comes. <coughs> so, we have seen uh, the need for the minimum frame size of 64 bytes. However, there is a uh, if, if there is a collision, uh, there is a possibility of late collisions that take place after 64 bytes that can happen because of excessive cable length or too many repeaters or faulty connector of defective network interface card. So, this can happen in abnormal situations. Otherwise, all the collisions will occur within this time, within the transmission time of 64 bytes. That is why that minimum length of the segment of the uh, packet is provided and during that transmission, all the collisions will be detected. Now, let us come to the second important standard that is your IEEE 802.4 based on token bus. Because of the non-deterministic nature of the medium access control that is CSMS CD, many people from industry were not satisfied with the CSMS CD based protocol that is your 802.3, particularly uh, General Motors who are interested in factory automation. They suggested there should be an alternative where we can use send real time traffic or the time is deterministic that the maximum delay is deterministic and that is how the token bus uh, standard was uh, developed by IEEE 802 committee. Uh, here uh, as usual like Ethernet or IEEE 802.3 a bus is used and to which the computers are connected the way the computers can be connected in IEEE 803. However, they form a some kind of logical ring as you can see A is connected to B and B is connected to E, E is connected to G, but it is not necessary that they will follow the same order. So, the order in which it is connected to the cable can be different from the order in which this logical ring is formed. <coughs> then each station passes a token to its successor to gain access uh, control of the bus. That means, there is a token, uh, each station will uh, uh, get a token and whenever it gets a token, it transmits the data and uh, in this way, the data transmission is possible and there are four priority cl classes 0, 2, 4 and 6 with 0 the lowest and 6 as the highest priority. That means, uh, if a particular station has uh, frames of highest priority, it will first send those frames and then other station, then uh, it will send the lower order, lower priority frames. So, in this way, so we find that to support uh, real time traffic, priority concept is introduced in token bus uh, protocol. And here is the frame format used in token bus, uh, token bus uh, standard. Uh, as you can see, this frame format is different from IEEE 802.3 frame. Here you have got the preamble. Preamble is essentially for the purpose of synchronization, but instead of 7 bytes, here it is only 1 byte. Then there is a start delimiter, start delimiter which uh, is signifies the beginning of the frame and also there is a end delimiter which is a special uh, character used for uh, by marking the uh, start and end of the frame. So, the packet length is not mentioned here. This is essentially limited by the start delimiter and end delimiter. And as usual, there are destination address and source address 
and how, however, the token bus standard allows 2 byte or 6 byte address and 6 byte address is very similar uh, to that IEEE 802.3. Then the data size can be here from 0 to 81, uh, uh, 8182. Of course, whenever 6 byte address is used, you have to subtract two, uh, 4 from here, so it becomes 0 to 8176. If you subtract 4, then 78, so it can be 8178 maximum whenever 6 byte address is used. Whenever 2 byte address is used, then it is uh, 0 to 8182. Now, there is a frame control bit. The frame control bit has got the frame control bit has got the priority bits and it signifies whether it is a data frame or a or a token or a control frame and it performs various types of control apart from the priority and it specifies it is a and it is a control frame as you can see uh, there are uh, several uh, types of frame control which are mentioned here, claim token, solitary successor 1, solitary successor 2, who follows, token, set successor. Let us see how it is being done in a distributed manner in token bus, that means the ring maintenance. So, ring maintenance is a very complex, uh, uh, complex case in case of token ring, possibly the medium access control is the most complex here. Now, this uh, claim token packet as I have shown here, this particular packet is used uh, in the beginning uh, in, at the time of initialization in, in case of a loss token or whenever there is no token at all. That means, when a particular station is turned on, a system is turned on, then uh, this, this, this will, this will, it will send a claim token packet and uh, it will it will say that uh, uh, this this is the it is the uh, <coughs> this particular uh, a, the token is the the particular station is holding the token that means in the beginning there will be no station active so whenever a particular station turns on it sends the claim token packet and it sends the token it it be, it, it essentially is the uh, holder of the token. Now, gradually other uh, uh, there in the one after the other the stations has to join the ring, how it can be done. So, that is being done with the help of this solid solicit successor one uh, frame. Whoever is holding the token occasionally will send the solicit successor one frame. So, whenever a solicit successor frame is sent, the other stations who are waiting for joining the ring will uh, send a resolve, uh, will send a solicit success, uh, I mean will respond and uh, join the ring. And however, if there is collision, there is a possibility that more than one stations are waiting and wanting to join the ring, then the resolved consent, consent, uh, contention packets are used to resolve the collision. And in this way, one after the other, the uh, rings can join. Suppose the a particular station has the uh, predecessor P and successor address S, and this is the address. That means, if a new station joins, then what will happen? The successor address, this uh, the new station's uh, address will be the successor's address. So it's a new addition and uh, the new station will have the X as the pre uh, pre predecessor and the uh, that successor will become the address of the new station. So, in this way a station can join. However, the addresses are uh, arranged in a uh, higher in the in a descending order. That means, the packets are transmitted in a descending order. That means, here it goes from the highest address to the highest address to the lowest address and so on. In this way it goes. Then, uh, a particular stations may want to leave the ring, in that case it sends a set successor packet. It is very easy to do, for example, a station has the predecessor P and successor S. And so, if it wants to leave the ring, it will simply ask the predecessor 
to make x as its successor. So, now x as x is the successor of p, but now x will request so s as the successor of p in this way x will come out of the ring. So, this is done by uh, using the set successor packet for by broadcasting by sending this uh, this this particular address this uh, successor's address. Now, <coughs> that solicit successor 2 this is also necessary uh, in situations where uh, the, con the contention uh, suppose there is no response from other stations in that case uh, the uh, this is being used for uh, new new, uh, new stations to join the ring. Now, this uh, fault management is necessary involves fault management of uh, duplicate frame. So, uh, it uses who follows packet when a successor does not respond in time. That means, in this case what is happening a particular station has sent a token its successor either should send the data frame or it should send the token. But if it does not respond then uh, this uh, then this particular uh, this is being done and a who, fo who follows packet is sent who follows means that the next successor if the present successor does not respond uh, the successor of the successor has to respond. If the successor of the successor does not respond then then this particular solicit, solicit successor 2 uh, packet is uh, introduced. So, that whoever is in the ring uh, can join or waiting for joining can join. So, in this way uh, in this way the ring maintenance is being done in a dynamic manner. So, here we find this ring maintenance is performed in a distributed manner. Uh, and any any uh, station who is holding the token will act as some kind of uh, master and will can issue these control frames. On the other hand in IEEE 802.5 which is based on token ring as you can see rings are organized uh, in a logical ring, physical ring as you can see uh, here it can operate in two modes either it is in the uh, it is in the receive mode or monitor mode or in the transmit mode. So, if a, if a particular station is simply if it is simply looking at or watching the uh, uh, trans frames to go go by then there is a it receives the packet it introduces a delay of 1 bit then retransmits. So, in this way there is a delay of 1 bit as a token or a frame goes by, but if a particular station gets a free token then it grabs it and then it changes to the transmit mode. So, whenever it uh, changes to the transmit mode it receives the uh, it breaks the link as you can see logically and it receives the token and then it transmits the frame into the ring. So, this is how there are two possible modes one is your uh, the receive mode another is transmit mode. Now, this is a very uh, unreliable situation in the sense that the, the way uh, it is connected if there is a break anywhere then the entire ring collapses no communication is possible because each particular station has to take part in relaying the token or the frame. So, to overcome that problem a wiring concentrator is used where all the cables are connected to a central point which acts as a some kind of central uh, node uh, this wiring concentrator and there is a bypass relay uh, uh, for each of these stations. So, whenever a particular stations become faulty then it can be bypassed with the help by closing a uh, uh, micro switch or relay uh, for each of the stations. So, you can say this is the third mode known as bypass mode whenever this kind of wiring concentrator is used. So, in this topology the reliability of the topology can be improved by introducing a wiring concentrator as you can see. Now, here is the token ring frame format and as you can see the 
there are three bytes first one is is the starting delimiter second one is the access control and third one is the frame control and and then you have got the destination address source address as usual it can be from 2 to 6 bytes and surprisingly there is no limit on the data size in case of token ring network and uh, it uses only uh, 4 byte checksum uh, 4 byte checksum for error detection and there is ending delimiter and there is another byte at the end which essentially is used to in in indicate the frame status so that means as the frame goes by obviously the it is going in this direction first the starting delimiter then access control then the frame control then the destination at the source at this data in this way it goes and at the end when the last byte goes by the frame status can be indicated with the help of two bits a and c bits so uh, if it if the destination is not present that means by looking at this address so if the if it comes back then both are 0 0 initially both are 0 0 these two bits then as the ring traverses when if the if it is if if, if a destination address is uh, destination address gets it but if there is error then it does not accept the packet so it makes the changes the bit a to 1 but c remains to 0 and when as the frame goes by if it finds that the checksum is also correct then what it does it sets both the bits 1 and uh, a and a and c bits 1 so in this case destination is present and frame co copied that means as the frame goes by automatically the frame status bit uh, sends uh, and it acts as an acknowledgement to the source address so when the uh, frame goes to the destination uh, it removes it and also not only it removes it but it comes to know that there is a uh, whether there is a error or the frame has been removed or something like that <coughs> now uh, for the purpose of uh, for uh, as you can see there is a token whenever there is no data then then there is no need for destination address source address or anything so the access control bit specifies that this is a token and token is only 3 bytes comprising starting delimiter uh, then access control and frame control that means whenever there is no data this token keeps on circulating in a lightly load lightly loaded token ring network most of the time the token will keeps on circulating however whenever a station has some data we will grab the uh, frame and we, it will convert the token into this kind of frame format and send it now there is a uh, a monitor one of the stations is designed designated as a monitor station which performs the ring maintenance particularly it does uh, duplicate address test it does fault location whenever uh, there is some break in the network and whenever uh, there is no uh, I mean there is no uh, monitor it finds that there is no monitor it tries to claim the token to become a monitor this is necessary in the beginning and whenever uh, there is a orphan packet circulating around the ring it purges and also uh, in occasionally it sends a token a token a frame indicating that the mon active monitor is present and also uh, uh, when there are some other stations who are who can who has the potential to become monitor occasionally sends this kind of frame so that in case of or, uh, the active monitor uh, fails then this particular standby monitor will take over now here is a quick comparison of the, uh, of the three protocols uh, so far as the access determination is concerned csm and cd uses contention token bus uses a token token ring also uses token passing packet length restriction as we have seen in case of csm and cd there is a packet length restriction of 64 bytes which has to be greater than twice the propagation maximum propagation time now in case of token bus of, or token ring there is no such limits then priority is not supported in csm and cd it is both supported in token bus and token ring and sensitivity to workload 
the CSMACD is the most sensitive, token ring is sensitive, but token ring is the least sensitive. And the principal advantage of CSMACD is the simplicity and it has got wide installed base. Token bus is, has got regulated or fair access. The token ring also has got regulated and fair access. Principal disadvantage of CSMACD as we know non-deterministic delay and token bus has, has the highest complexity and token ring is, is also complex but lesser than the token bus. So, here is the time to give you the review questions. Question number 1 is list the functions uh, performed by physical layer of 802.3 standard. Question 2, why do you require a limit on the minimum uh, size of Ethernet frame? Question 3, why token bus is performed over CSMACD? Question 4, what are the drawbacks of token ring topology? Question 5, how the reliability of token ring topology can be improved? So, these questions will be answered in the next lecture. So, here is the answer to the first question of lecture number 27, in what way FDM differs for FDMA? In FDM, channels are statically assigned to different stations, which is inefficient in case of bus traffic. On the other hand, channels can be allocated on demand. Uh, the efficiency is improved in FDMA by allocating on demand by using dynamic sharing technique to access a particular frequency band. So, this is your FDMA. Question 2 was in what way CDMA differs from FDMA? In FDMA, the transmissions from different stations are separated in frequency. On the contrary, in CDMA, the transmission from different stations occupy the entire frequency band at the same time and multiple simultaneous transmissions are separated by coding theory as we have discussed in detail. Question 3 was what happens when multiple signals collide in C CDMA? We know that as multiple signals collide in CDMA, they are added to form a new sequence which is used uh, at the receiving end to duplex to demultiplex the same data. Uh, what is an inner product? We have discussed that uh, if, uh, it is essentially if two code sequences are multiplied element by element and the result are added, we get a number called inner product. For example, S1 and S2 are the two codes and if, if we multiply them and add them, we get 0. Uh, so, if we multiply two different codes, we get the inner product as 0. Uh, on the other hand, if S1 into S1 is uh, 4 because you have got 4 chip sequences, so inner product is uh, 4 and similarly, the inner product for S1 into S1, S1 bar is 0 or it can be uh, say S1 dot S2 bar is also 0. Question number 5 is compare and contrast FDMA, TDMA and CDMA techniques. So, here is the answer. In case of FDMA, the bandwidth is divided into separate frequency band. In case of TDMA, the bandwidth is time shared. On the other hand, in case of TDA, CDMA, data from all stations are transmitted simultaneously and are separated uh, based on coding theory. Unlike FDMA, TDA, CDMA has got soft capacity, which means that there is no hard limit. Particularly, in FDMA and TDMA, it is band limited. On the other hand, in CDMA, it is interference bit. But CDMA offers higher capacity in comparison to FDMA and CD TDMA. CDMA also help to combat multiple path, multipath, multipath fading. So, with this we conclude today's lecture. In the next lecture, we shall discuss about the high speed local area networks. Thank you.